Good morning, everyone, and welcome to church service this Sunday morning, September 6th, for Adamsville Presbyterian Church. I'll run down through some of our prairie concerns. Pat Minnis and the Preston family, the Betty Christie family, Mia Thomas, Bob and Alice, Bill Benetine, Dave Yonkers, McGranahan family, the George family, Zeke and Zeb, Herman Peroni, Tony Owens, Matt Stewart, Daryl Edens, Big Corky Williams, and here's Harry. Well, good morning. I'm glad to worship with you this day. Next week, we'll be worshiping it live and in person. Let's pray for our folks who we know are on our prayer list. Our Father and God, we thank you so much for your love. We pray that your spirit be with all of the people we know who are ill granting unto them healing. We pray that you bless little Mia. May she be totally well. We pray that you protect Bill, give him your strength. And Bob and Alice, we know that we have families that are mourning people. We pray that you protect and bless each of them. Give them the strength and courage that comes from knowing that there is the great gift of everlasting life. Be with us as we worship today. We pray, Lord, that each of us will be just a little wee bit closer to you for this experience. We pray that your love embrace and encompass each of us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Wayne. Morning, please join us again. Oh, how lovely is your name, O oh Lord. Oh, how lovely is your name. Mighty wonders and mercies you afford. Oh, how lovely is your name. Creation cries out. And all the heavens sing. Of the glorious working of the King. Deliverance has come. And the time is now to offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Praise you for all your gifts. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Invocation. Open our eyes, Lord, that we might see your face. Fill our hearts and minds with understanding. Lead us to things spiritual. Motivate us that we might live as you would have us live. Lord, we be Christian. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. And our hymn is number 550. Give praise to the Lord. Oh, 
and you made my Sunday the happiest Sunday in a long time. Thank that's you for singing hard. that with me. That's a hard song to sing. Well, you nailed it, so thank you. <laughs> well, join me now for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, 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 maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ his only Son, our Lord, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And sit on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge us quick. I believe in the Holy Ghost, Holy Catholic, Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. For where your treasure is, there will your heart will be as well. O oh Lord, forgive us our attachments to things not worthy of our hearts. Forgive us for investing our minds and emotions in things. And strengthen us to break free from the love of stuff, that we might give our hearts only to that which is worthy. Love of you. Service to those in need. Neighbors and friends. Lovers and children. And whatever else is of you. That our lives might count. Rather than be wasted on things of little value. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I announce the good news of the gospel to you. We are forgiven, but for the asking of our faith. Amen. Thank you so much, Wayne. And now we come to the junior sermon. There's two fantastic verses of scripture in the material that is used in this Sunday's lectionary passage. And so I hope I can share something that will be a real value to all of the children who are part of our worship service. At the end of the first segment of the scripture, there is this promise. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. That is a marvelous, marvelous promise. I do believe that our wonderful God is present with us all of the time. And that makes life much nicer when I know I'm not alone, when I know that the creator of this cosmos loves me and is with me and protects me. And one of the promises I like to share with young children is the fact that God always is there to give you love and support, and hope and beauty. That's the magnificence of our faith. And I know as we worship on Zoom, God is present with each of us, that God is here to make the air electric with energy. 
But next Sunday, it's going to be wonderful because we're able to see you. And mm -hmm. as we worship together and as we look at each other's faces, we know that Jesus mm -hmm. is the unseen host of the worship service. Something that I added to my communion service because my pastor, Jim Barnett, always said it when he shared communion with me. And Jim was my pastor for 20 years before he died and before I was ordained. But he always, at each communion service, began with the statement, I would remind you, this communion table is no longer the table of the Fremont Avenue Presbyterian Church. But rather, it is the table of the Lord, and he's present, and he's the unseen host of this communion service. So when I share communion at Adamsville with the congregation, I always begin it as Jim Barnett began his communion service by saying, I would remind each of you that this no longer is the table of the Adamsville Presbyterian Church. Jesus is the unseen host. He is present here. And I believe that with all of my heart. The Lord Jesus Christ is always with us. And it's comforting to know that whenever two or three Christian people are together in worship, there the spirit of Jesus Christ is present. You know, uh, it doesn't, you can have a huge church, which can be very nice, with thousands of people in worship. Or you can have a very small attendance, two or three people. And it's exactly the same. And the reason is it is the same is that the Lord Jesus Christ is present. And the Spirit's there to build faith. And what I tell little children and what I tell adults is we must learn to trust in the Lord so that we're open to the message that we're given by this wonderful, magnificent God of ours as he works through each of us to build faith in each other. And you know, I think the Holy Spirit is so important. And I always teach that while the Holy Spirit does good things for each individual, the reason the Spirit is in us is for other people. And that as we as Christian people get together, as we share our faith, as we open ourselves to the power of God, there we find peace and hope. So that's the one exciting verse. And the other one's going to come up when I talk about the fact that Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive a person? Seven times. And Jesus said, no, 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 70 times seven. And he didn't mean that we kept the checklist and when we hit 490 times, we stopped forgiving and the 491st time we judge. What he meant is that we always so it's wonderful to have those two marvelous verses in the same passage of scripture this morning. The one knowing that Jesus always is with us, and when two or three are gathered in his name, nothing special happens. And to know that we are always to forgive. The good news is we can do that because we're always forgiven. Our Father and God, we thank you for these precious young people. We pray they continue to come to us so that together we can worship and praise your name. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. And now for the morning prayer. Our Father and God, each of us in our own way, bring our care and concern before you. Lord, so much happens every week. It's a fast-paced world. And there's so much sin. And there's so much evil where human beings seek to hurt and destroy other human beings. We pray that such activities cease. And we ask that there be peace everywhere. To that end, bless all of the leaders of all of the governments on this earth. Give them the ability to be moral, to do right, to build for a better life for all people. We pray that you be with our president and those who lead this nation. Give them the ability to step away from bitterness and to work together so that there be a common good for this nation. We pray that you will protect our military, 
here and in the far places. Keep them always safe. We pray there be no more war. We thank you that we are protected by police and by fire departments. We pray that you be with each of these individuals as they begin their daily shifts. Keep them safe and bring them back to their stations without injury. We pray that the turmoil that is so violent in this country somehow cease that we as a nation find our wounds and move forward in such a way that we give honor and dignity to all people and hate and prejudice and discrimination. We pray that justice be done. We're in a Labor Day season now and it's kind of terrifying when we look out and seeing people going to beaches and running around together without masks on, without making a six foot separation. Teach the people of this world that we do have responsibility to remain safe. We pray that this horrible coronavirus be conquered, that no more die from it. We pray, Lord, that everybody work together in such a way that they provide the safety of all people. We pray for the Adamsville Church. With enthusiasm, we come back to worship next week. We pray, Lord, that you will bless us and protect us, that we do it safely, that we do it wisely. And we pray that our church sure will have the gospel message to share. We pray that we will reach out to our community and bring into our midst people who now are not part of any church. But we pray for all Christian churches everywhere. Be with them as they go back to worship. We pray that they be safe and that the gospel be spread with great power and strength. May there be a renewal of faith, Lord, across this nation. We pray for our own people who are sick, but we pray for all of humanity. Find them in their places of suffering and grant unto them healing. We pray that you will help people make tough decisions, that they be made correctly and wisely. We pray that you bring healing to all. Be with the many who mourn, comfort them, dry their tears. Be with those who come through the valley of the shadow of death before we worship again. We pray they have faith for eternity. We pray great blessings upon this world of ours. Be with the young as they go back to school. Keep them safe, Lord. We pray that you will indeed bless our land and our people. And all of this we ask in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we have in peace like a river, it is well with my soul. Combination of two fantastic pieces of music. <laughs>
much, Nikki. 149th Psalm is a psalm of praise for God's goodness to Israel. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Her praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with victory. Let the faithful exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their couches. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the people to bind their kings with fetters and their nobles with chains of iron this is the glory for all his faithful ones praise the lord following the lectionary this week i am reading from the 18th chapter of the gospel of matthew beginning with the 15th verse. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If a member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and as a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there also. And Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, or you could translate if my brother sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times. And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 70 times seven. Wow, that's 490 times. One of the most charming of the older American homes is the Hermitage, not far outside of Nashville, Tennessee. When I was a small boy, I went to the Hermitage with my dad and mom. And a few years ago, Diana and I made the trip. Andrew Jackson, in spite of his many faults, stands as one of the great American heroes. He must be judged as a man of his time, not as a modern American. I do not agree with his policy on Native Americans. The disgrace of his administration was the Trail of Tears, where Indians were forced to move by foot from Florida to the far west. On this subject, President Andrew Jackson was deeply flawed. At the Hermitage, the fiercely independent President Andrew Jackson lived for over a half a century. He built that place for 
his wife, Rachel. And he's buried there in a very modest tomb. On the plot of the ground across from the hermitage stands a little Presbyterian church, which Jackson built as a gift for his wife. It promised his wife when he finally was done with all politics, he would join the church. It was not until 1842, three years before the death of Andrew Jackson, that he made a profession of faith. And the reason he waited so long was that he feared his political enemies would say that he joined the church for political gain. Fourteen years after the death of his wife, he took communion for the first time, and he was received as a member of that Presbyterian church. When the minister was examining him as to his faith and his experience, he asked old Hickory a question that I certainly would not have had the courage to ask him. He said, and I quote, General, there's one more thing that it is my duty to ask you. Can you forgive your enemy? The question was posed in view of the many feuds and of the duels and of the many quarrels that Andy Jackson had with political enemies over the course of his career. After a moment of silence, Andrew Jackson responded, my political enemies I can freely forgive, but for those who attack me for my service for the country, or those who slandered my wife. Doctor, that's a totally different case. I don't know how I can forgive. The preacher told him that a person who harbored ill feelings against another person could not make a sincere profession of faith. There was great silence. And then Andrew Jackson promised to try as hard as he possibly could to forgive his political enemy. This done, his name was written on the roll of the church. For the first time in his life, he received Holy Communion and he became a member of our denomination. There's no doubt about it. You and I as believers in Jesus Christ have the responsibility placed upon us to forgive one another. One of the Lord's greatest teachings brings out this truth. On one occasion, Peter, who may have been troubled by some wrong done against him, came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? Peter thought he was being extremely generous. Following the traditions of Israel, no one forgave a person for a particular sin more than three times. I think the I being, being three times, shame on you, four times, shame on me. It was a point where you were to stop forgiving. Jesus looked into the eyes of Peter and he said, I say to you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. For Jesus, forgiveness was something that was to be unlimited. It must extend forever. In the scriptures, no duty is so frequently placed upon us as the duty to forgive other people. Jesus said, we are to love our enemies and pray for them who deceitfully use us. Paul said, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. We are instructed both by Paul and by the Lord Jesus Christ not to make judgments upon other people. 
First Corinthians tells us that the proper time for judgment is when the Lord comes. Before this, and no one can accurately access the other person's life. We must forgive forever and always. See, the idea is that we're not the judge because God is the only one with the authority to judge. Paul wrote, judgment is mine, saith the Lord. And he said this before in all of my churches. I think sometimes I would like to say, judgment is mine, saith the Lord. And I've appointed Harry Johns to carry it out. But I know if I say that, I am being totally inaccurate. I do not have the authority to judge and neither does anyone else. I kind of think judgment, it goes straight out from a person and it hits them there and it reflects back on the person who is making the judgment. Now how this works, I'm not certain, but I think I do have a couple good ideas. I noticed that people usually tend to judge people for tendencies they are inclined to see in themselves and they judge them much more severely than they judge themselves. And often the condemnation goes out and hits the other person and splashes right back on our face. You see, so many times we see somebody else doing something, and we think if we had the courage, we would do the same thing. Therefore, we're condemning ourselves, or it could be totally the opposite. We could look out and see somebody doing something wrong that we do not do, and so we could judge more harshly. Sort of like the guy who plays sports very poorly. It'd be so easy for him to condemn, just rip apart a good athlete somewhere else. Another thing, if we judge and we refuse to forgive another person, it may be that we have a little bit of a jealous streak going right through the center of our being. This acts as a revelation in and of itself. See, our motivation then is not the service of God. It is envy of our fellow human beings. I suggest it is so much easier on our constitution if we learn to live a life of forgiveness. I believe, and I think this is important, God offers people two platforms in which they can live and they can make the choice. One is a platform of mercy and love. If you choose forgiveness as a way of life, then you are living on that platform. The other platform is a platform of judgment. And if you judge other people severely, what you are asking God to do is use that same standard on you that you live, use on other people. But you see, the problem is we're all sinners. You and I always need to stand on the platform of love and of forgiveness. That is an important fact. You know, we do not forgive because we spend most of our lives taking our own pleasures while trying to avoid pain. When someone hurts us, it's natural to respond by eliminating that person from our lives. Block our goals and their objectives, and it's possible that we may even become violent. Certainly the average good person of the world tries to counter attack. Thus our lives are often filled with quarrels, with favoritism, and on the international front, with war. But you and I can move beyond this. Through the strength of the Holy Spirit in our lives, you and I can move to forgiveness. I wish I could have been there when Jesus answered Peter's question. 
how many times should I forgive a person? And the master said 70 times seven. I'm certain there was a tone in the voice of Jesus and a look in his eyes, which must have startled Peter. Perhaps he said to himself, why does the master look at me this way? Well, one day Peter was to learn the meaning of this look in Jesus' face. It was the night of the master's arrest. Peter bragged that he would never deny Jesus. Before the cock crowed though, he denied the master three times. He did this with a loud oath and he denied that he was a disciple of Jesus or that he had ever known the man. I am certain that Peter needed forgiveness from God far more than the 490 times. What he needed was unconditional forever forgiveness. And this the master granted Peter. And the good news is that Jesus provided forgiveness, not just for Peter alone, but for each and every one of us. Peter now understood why Jesus said 70 times seven. Peter needed radical forgiveness. And I know this old preacher man needs radical forgiveness too. I need far more than the 490 offenses. I suggest that each of you also needs radical forgiveness. And this is why we should forgive one another and not just 70 times seven or 490 times. We should give ultimate forgiveness. The place to start practicing this is in the private sphere. With your spouse, with your children, with your parents, with your friends. I've said this to the Adamsville people before. Years ago, I made a commitment to forgive any of my family or any member of my church for any imagined offense. My prayer is that my family and the members of my church will always forgive me for any injury I have inflicted upon them. From here, we can move out and share our forgiveness in larger areas. One other thing, there is a big, big difference between forgiving a person and forgetting their offense. There's an old saying that has some truth in it, that there's nothing better than forgiveness and a 500 mile separation between the people who were involved in the argument. And there may be some truth in that. But you know, the magnificent thing about our God is God forgets. You always hear me talking about divine amnesia. That's the new covenant. When Jesus comes, I will remember your sins no more. That's total and complete forever forgiveness. We forgive, but rarely do we forget. I think one of the things all of us should work on is to develop the ability when we forgive, then to forget. Gene, do we have anybody sharing a reason why it's good to be part of church today? Uh, it's good to be part of church. Go ahead, Simeon. Uh, it's good to be part of church because you learn about the Bible and it's a place to give and spread good news. Just your church family. Man, I'd say amen to all of that. Good job, Zibian. Again, and again, we need so much to have the funds to be able to support our mission and to support the church. It's always, there are three ways that you can do it. You can do it online or you can check to the church or next week when we worship, you can bring your envelope. But it's important to support the church. Thank you, Simeon, what you said. I was right on. Our Father in God, we do pray that you will bless our church. 
giving us the ability to serve well in all of the things we do and give us the ability to support the mission areas that are important to us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. And now we have our closing hymn, which is number 754. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now and in the life everlasting. Amen. And now we will have...